Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, last night, the government secured a victory. Way! Isn't that wonderful? They've stopped. They managed to stop the House of Lords amendments, and there are more being voted on. We'll get another vote on the Customs Union at around about 7.30 this evening, and we'll get LBC's political editor, Theo Ashwa, to tell us how that goes. But victory in politics can be a funny old thing, <laughs> because last night's victory was accompanied by a lot of of shenanigans. Uh, Dominic Grieve, uh, perhaps the leader of a group of people who want to do everything they can to make sure that we do not leave the European Union without some kind of deal, and they want, they want Parliament to have the final say. Uh, we didn't cover this in depth last night because it was incredibly complicated. Um, and I suspect today, those of you listening will not know the exact details of this. In fact, to be honest, I'm not sure anybody in Parliament really knows the full details of this. What we do know is Theresa May has made more concessions. And if the agreement she struck with rebels comes to pass, then in February next year, if there's no deal, Parliament could veto the whole Brexit process. And we would not be leaving on March the 29th next year. Now, I'm not saying we've got to that, but what I am saying is that if you're a Brexiteer, I'm very keen to test the temperature of how you're feeling about the process. Now, normally on this programme, we appeal for Remainers to ring in, to come on and challenge me, but I genuinely want to know tonight, where are you as a Brexiteer? Are you happy with what Mrs May's doing? Do you think we're heading in the right direction? And if you do, please call me on 0345 973 Maybe you're disillusioned to the point, and I met some people in Cornwall last week who said to me, do you know what? If this doesn't happen, we'll just never, ever bother to vote for anybody again. Do you feel utterly disillusioned? And if you do, please text to 84850. Or are you really blooming angry? Are you hopping? Are you telling your MP you'll never vote for them again unless they deliver what they were honour bound to do? And if that's how you feel, angry, then please tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC, at LBC, and of course... Watch us on Facebook and comment there too. So it's the second day of parliamentary debate. And there are two speeches that I think sum up uh, the two sides of the argument here. The first was delivered just about an hour ago by Labour MP Caroline Flint. And she was speaking during the debate on the EU withdrawal bill. There has to be an end to freedom of movement, just in the way my honourable friends on the front bench have suggested, and then we, out of that, decide what sort of migration we want in the future. And my constituents, who have been insulted, those Leave constituents, day in and day out, by some of the comments in this place and outside, are not against all migration. But they do want to have a sense that we can turn the tap on and off when we choose, but also they want us to answer the question, why hasn't Britain got the workforce it needs? Why is social mobility stopped? Why do we train fewer doctors? Why do we train fewer doctors than Holland or Ireland? And why are these jobs dominated by those in the middle and upper classes so my constituents don't get a look in? Quite right, I would say. I mean, Caroline Flint there saying everything I've been saying for 20 years um, and in many ways summing up why people voted for Brexit. But there are fewer Caroline Flint's in the House of Commons than there are people like Conservative MP Anna Soubry because she was the next speaker up. I'm sorry, Mr Speaker. I know it's courtesy, but that was, it is not a pleasure to follow the speaker, of the Honourable Lady, Right Honourable Lady for Don Valley, somebody who I have admired for many years, but have found that to be one of the saddest speeches that I've ever heard. I will be voting... Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you why. St stop the clock. C can I please appeal to colleagues? I understand there are raging passions on these issues, but please let's try to treat each other with respect. One of the saddest speeches that Anna Soubry. How dare Caroline Flynn even discuss immigration, let alone controls? It is a disgraceful, horrible, awful, racist, nasty thing to do. That's what Anna Soubry thinks, and I'll tell you what, folks, that's what most of our MPs think. I sat and watched that interrogation yesterday of Aaron Banks and Andy Wigmore. And whatever you think of Banks and Wigmore, what struck me 
was every single MP on that committee, every single one, voted Remain and still believes in Remain, and nearly all of them represented Leave constituencies. Something fundamentally has gone wrong in this country. Do you know, if you take the whole of England and Wales, the whole of England and Wales, only London and Surrey in the big uh, government areas voted to remain. Every other major local government district of England and Wales voted to leave. Most of our MPs represent leave constituencies. I'm not disillusioned just with Mrs May, who I think is useless. I'm actually disgusted by our entire political class. And I can see the opportunity here that George Soros and others are moving into as they gear up their, their campaign to force us to have a second referendum. It's about time, I think, we told our members of Parliament what we really thought. That's how I feel about this. But I'm asking you, do you feel angry as I do? Do you want to tell your MP how you feel? Or are you now just disillusioned with the whole blooming thing? Paul is calling from Brecon in Mid Wales. Good evening. Good evening. Well, f first of all, um, I do believe now that we're going to get a soft Brexit, which is just a nice name for no Brexit. And when we get no Brexit, um, the political landscape is going to be completely open for a single party standing in the on the no Brexit or a real Brexit maybe party. Maybe yep. call it the real Brexit party, no matter what. But I also see the Conservative Party splitting. I, I, I just don't see how, how the Anna Soubrys... Uh, and, and the Jacob Peace marks are compatible. I really don't. I, I, no, I, I, Paul, I've felt that for 25 years. I've looked at I the know, Tory but party. I think the time is coming on this with the betrayal <coughs> of the people. I think on the Labour side, you've got a Lever in charge, a Lever in charge who's just playing political games all the time and, and putting forward policies that make no sense at all because there's not a chance at all. I, I could use another word there, but there's not a chance at all they'd ever be accepted by the EU. So what we've got is a lot, I'm just totally disillusioned, but I totally disagree with your people in Cornwall. We can use the vote to change it. That is the only thing that those wishy-washy people in Parliament who pretend to represent us will actually listen to, will actually take notice of. And that is, so we have to dem democratise No, Paul, I, 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 I think on balance you're right. I think if Brexit is not properly de uh, delivered then the next earthquake to come in British politics, Brexit being the first one, will be a change of the political landscape in terms of our political parties. I do agree with that. But where, Paul, would you be? where would you be, Nigel? Well, we'll you? come to that. But, Paul, can I ask you, why are the Tory Eurosceptics not vocal, more vocal? Why did they accept, you know, Theresa May rushing off at four o'clock in the morning to see Monsieur Barnier back in December and agreeing to a backstop? Why are the Tory Eurosceptics not standing up for Brexit more boldly? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, the Jacob Rees Mogg's are, the number of backbenchers are. Obviously, you can't stand up in the government. You've got to sort of try to get the best out of it. You can, or mm. resign. That seems to be the only two options there. Well, um, I, I don't know, I, Paul. I don't know, that, Paul. I mean, I, I remember uh, some uh, decrying me. Oh, isn't it typical, they said in December, Nigel Farage cries betrayal. Everybody else is happy. They're not really... You know, Jacob does say some very good things, but it's, it's almost to me as if... They all seem to think putting the party first is what matters more than anything. Now, when you put a party before your own principles, and actually, at least Subri, you know, belongs to her own principles. As it yes, were. you could say you know, that, yeah. when, when you put the party or a group before you, you no longer have integrity. Mm. Uh, and that's basically what, what, what the lack of integrity yeah, and is shown by the Labour Party. They don't have integrity. And wasn't it funny that, you, you know, there we had Caroline Flint saying, look... Immigration is key. We want to have control over it. It's what people yeah. voted for. And yet Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and all the others are now talking about a liberal Brexit, where basically we don't restrict the numbers coming into Britain. Paul, some is... just lose my respect. That, that is total lack of respect for mm. the vote and for what people voted for. Yep. You know, I'm fed up with, with one particular view being, po be, being considered to be either Nazi or anything just by even discussing the subject. No. Just by even discussing the subject. Uh, 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 and I hate racism in any form, but people want to brand you when you raise the subject yes. with a stamp on your head, regardless of, of, of what the truth is. Yeah, which is pretty much what we've reached in politics. Pretty much what Subri did today, wasn't it, to Caroline Flint? Paul, thank you for your call, and Paul thinks there could be a big change in the landscape if this is not delivered. What does Nicola in Harrogate think? Good evening. Hello, Nigel. Nice, nice to speak to you. Good to speak to you. Um, I am absolutely astounded, and I, and I met, made a comment a few weeks ago um, about 
uh, Remainer, being Theresa May, and her Chancellor, Philip Hammond, a Remainer, basically discussing or, or agreeing to Brexit with, you know, for, for us, for, for us Brexiteers. Yep. I find it absolutely astounding. Um, I, I think, uh, well, I'm at a loss, actually. I really am at a loss. Do you, I mean, Nicola, are you, do you feel like giving up or do you feel like fighting back? No, absolutely not giving up at all. Fighting back, very much so. But I just think at every turn we are, you know, served another order or whatever, you know, and the, these remainers are just trying to bring us down. And I think that's very, very sad. Yeah, Nicola, you're right. We're going to have to fight and fight very hard. Thank you. Nigel, I'm left wondering, what is the point of democracy? If less than a few hundred lords and MPs can dismiss 17.4 million votes, then I fear for our great country. And I think in some ways the best comment I've seen about the shenanigans yesterday, about the can being kicked down the road, about the potential of MPs being able, perhaps at the end of this, to stop it from happening, was a tweet put out from Andrew Neil, veteran political uh, commentator. He said, nobody outside the Westminster bubble understands what happened today. And even 90% of those in the bubble aren't sure. This thus does the degradation of British politics continue. And he's right. This is all the degradation of our politics. The continued l lack of faith and belief that those that are elected to serve us are actually doing the right thing. I think there is a lot of growing anger and disillusionment out there. Quite how that focuses itself over the course of the next year or two, I'm not yet sure. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It is now 7.15. Well, whilst our political class do their best to water down, delay or even stop Brexit or force a second referendum, um, and isn't it interesting, Gina Miller, who fought that case all the way to the Supreme Court because she wanted Parliament to have the final say, no, nope, no longer, she now just wants a second referendum. And this is the campaign that, of course, the American billionaire George Soros is backing. But whilst all that's going on, let's talk a little bit for a moment about the real world. Because figures out today from the Office of National Statistics show that since the day we voted Brexit nearly two years ago, there have been 1,000 new jobs created in this country every single day. A thousand new jobs created every single day since we voted Brexit. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, Ramonas. And a piece of news that I really do like. I've been talking about the Brexit boom. What do I mean by that? Well, the local town to me, you know, now is producing 20,000 bottles of sparkling wine every year. A new brewery, opened up quite recently and you can see the shops beginning to sell British local produce and people really wanting to buy it and I genuinely think Brexit could be quite good news for that sort of thing. Well Tim Martin who runs the Weatherspoons pub chain has made an announcement that from the 9th of July no longer will Weatherspoons sell drinks that come from the European Union. There's going to be no more champagne and no more beers produced in France and Germany. No, instead, it's going to be replaced by UK wheat, wheat beers, champagnes and sparkling wines from countries like Australia. Martin said this move helps us to broaden our horizons so we can create a better offer for our two million weekly customers. Anyway, that's enough of the real world. Let's get back to the world of politics. Are you dis if you're a Brexit voter, are you disillusioned with Mrs May? Are you happy and think actually she's doing the right stuff and we're on course? Or are you blooming angry and think bigger change is needed in British politics? Susan says on Facebook, May has let us all down. Too much messing about. All their behaviour could put them out of a job. People will not forget, says Susan. Lynn on Twitter says, I've already told my MP that if he bodges this, he's out. Frankly, this is a disgrace, a blemish on our democracy. I agree with that, Lynn, completely. If Anna Soubry is happy, then we know we're being stitched up. Annoyed isn't even the word. Fuming, more like I get by text. Yes, I'm completely disillusioned, I get on Twitter. This soft Brexit is not what I voted for. Feel like there's no point in ever 
voting for anything ever again. And you know, Rose, that is what I was beginning to hear last week down in Cornwall from people. Maybe that's because they haven't got a focus. And whilst Jacob Rees-Mogg does pop up and say some good things, you always feel, even with Jacob, he will ultimately do what the whips say and toe the party line. And one here I like. I would rather have Caroline Flint as Prime Minister than Theresa May, and I'm a lifelong Conservative. I think that says it all, says Michael. And Michael, do you know what? This issue is bigger than traditional party politics. It really, really is. Mark is a brand new caller to this show, and he's calling from Gatwick. Good evening. Yeah, hi, hi uh, Nigel. Welcome. It's, um Great to be talking to you. I've been a lifelong fan of yours, and we need you back in politics, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I thought, I'd, I thought, Mark, after, you know, a quarter of a century of involvement, uh, nearly 20 years of giving my whole life to it, I thought I'd more than done my bit, but it, it would appear there are many that want to unpick it. Um, so, Mark, I am, I am watching all this very, very closely, and, yeah, if this continues, I'm going to have to make some sort of move, Mark, aren't I? Yeah, um, as a Christian, I actually think uh, spiritually we need to be outside Europe, never mind uh, physically and uh, environmentally, but that's another subject. Uh, my view is that um, I'm a bit radical. I think we should have left without a deal. <laughs> I think we should just, <laughs> just leave because we're going to regret it, I think, a few years down the road. Well, do you know something, Mark? Um, Varoufakis, who was the... Do you remember him? He was the Greek finance minister, the guy that walked up Downing Street wearing a leather donkey jacket. Um, and, you know, when he was trying to negotiate different terms for Greece as a member of the euro, he got nowhere. And he said right at the start of this, don't bother negotiating with the unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. You know, you cannot work with these people. They will try and stitch you up. So, Mark, actually, if we'd walked away rather more quickly... We'd be, we'd be in quite a good place, wouldn't we? Yeah, a absolutely. I'm, I'm quite radical, I'm afraid. Uh, I would have left last year. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, that, I, I, look, I don't think that's unreasonable, because, frankly, our Prime Minister is kicking the can so far down the road that, assuming we do leave the treaties on March the 29th next year, but we're going to be so wrapped up in transition periods, it's going to be six or seven years since the vote, at least until we get back any sense of control over our borders or the ability to sign outside trade deals. So, Mark, do I put you down as disillusioned or angry and ready to march? Um, I can't really say what I think, because I think I'd be arrested, but um, I'm, wi I'm willing to take up <laughs> I think you're the latter category. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much for letting us know your view. And, Mark, a radical Eurosceptic, thinks we should just have walked away. Well, we'd have saved ourselves a lot of pain. Might have been a bit of short-term disruption, but we'd have saved ourselves the agony that we're going through now. Nigel, I'm an American. If I were a Brit and democratic principles in my country were being undermined to this extent, I would be absolutely furious, says Jovi. Cynthia is calling from Guildford. Cynthia, good evening. Hello, Nigel. Nice to speak to you again. Good to speak to you. Yeah, I remember you called before. And, and, and I you, did, yes. Uh, and you were, you, know, you were very passionate about us voting to leave and the thing happening. How are you feeling now about it? Well, as the last caller said, I wouldn't actually dare tell you how I actually do feel. <laughs> but uh, I can assure you... Um, I, I'm so angry I can hardly speak about it because what I don't understand is we had... You hear the MPs and they're saying, well, what's best for the country? What's best for my constituents? What's best for this, that and the other? And, that, well, it's sovereignty. This is what Parliament's all about. This is how sovereignty works. No, it isn't. We had a referendum. This is not just a debate about other things. And we said we wanted to leave. So why, Nigel, do these MPs seem to think that they know far better than anybody ah, else? Ah, because, the Cynthia, because, Cynthia, about. Philip Lee, the Tory MP for Bracknell and junior minister who resigned his position yesterday morning, basically yes. said that we need to be protected from ourselves. Because, Cynthia, you are stupid, are you not? You voted Brexit. Well, you do Of course you're I thick, said. Cynthia. You don't yes, understand I what you've done. You need <laughs> Philip Lee to run your life for you. Absolutely. I have no, obviously, any idea about what I voted for. Neither did any of my friends who a lot are university educated. We're all sick. We're all stupid. Yeah. We all don't know. Absolutely. And 
Well, I had a. I was listening to um, Nick Ferrari this morning, and there was a, an MP on who I think she's uh, one of the Cambridge constituents constituencies, and she was saying that she has to stay vote for Remain because the jobs of all her uh, her constituents they're all in danger, and all this, that, and the other. And I thought to myself while I was listening to this, well, yeah. how can you look in a crystal ball? How the heck do you yeah, know Heidi Allen? More that was. Than well, that's because, uh, it was Heidi Allen speaking, that's because, Cynthia, money goes in to universities, Oxford and Cambridge particularly. And of course, without the European Union, Cynthia, you must understand this, there would be no science. Without the European Union, there'd have been no Darwin. Without the European Union, there'd have been no Isaac Newton. Without the European Union, we couldn't have sent a man to the moon. I mean, the whole thing, Cynthia, is nonsense, isn't it? It's, it is total it's, nonsense. It, and it's our money anyway. It's our money know, anyway. Why are the MPs that gets... being so arrogant, Nigel, and just <coughs> riding roughshod over 17 and a half million people? Because they're why? careerists, because they're careerists, because the influences on them come from big businesses and from big banks, uh, and because for some of them who really believe in it, this is like the new form of communism. You know, 100 years ago, people believed that uh, Marxist communism, socialism, was the thing that was going to make the world a better and fairer place. It failed catastrophically. The new big idea the new big globalist idea uh, and the European Union Cynthia, if you think about it actually is the prototype they want one big world government one world currency us all to be global citizens and, and, and freely to move around the world and that is the theory Cynthia that some of them actually believe in and the third category of our MPs are people Cynthia who in private would agree with you and I but haven't got the guts to stand up for their own opinions or their constituents for fear of what it will do to their parliamentary career. Well, quite frankly, I mean, if that's how they disregard us, what the heck is the point in ever voting in another election or referendum or what the heck ever again? I, Pointless. I, I think that is a question that millions of people are beginning to ask themselves. Um, so, so, Cynthia, uh, you know, if you had to change your vote, uh, vote for a new party, I mean, would you do so on this Brexit issue? Well, I would vote for you, Kip, but you know, you're not there anymore, are you? Well, I haven't gone that far away, but I'm no, not... No, I know, but, but you know what I mean. You do. And Cynthia, I do understand there's a lot of people asking me to do various things. And Cynthia, I've said all the way through, if the Brexit ball gets dropped, I will have to act and do something. And well, you I, will. I'm afraid uh, you will. And I, yeah. It, yeah. It's just becoming a complete and utter disaster. Yeah. And I'm just so fed up with the arrogance of, ev of these MPs and of the Lords and everywhere, all saying that they all know better yeah. than everybody else. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but they don't. No, nope. Cynthia, thank you for your call. And I couldn't possibly do nothing, otherwise Cynthia would be after me. You know, when people called Cynthia from Guildford feel as angry as that, something in our politics has gone very badly wrong. And as Mike says to me, where are the Brexit MPs fighting their corner? I don't know, Mike. They're basically invisible today, despite yet another sellout, yet another kicking of the can down the road that took place yesterday. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's now 7.30. More debates today in the House of Commons. More votes coming up in the House of Commons. This is the government trying to get its EU withdrawal bill through, having had 15 amendments passed against it in the House of Lords. Victory for the Prime Minister last night, but at a terrible, terrible cost. And the prospect, perhaps, we're not totally sure yet, but it could well be that if by February that nice Mr Barnier hasn't done any sort of a deal with us, well, then you could find MPs actually having a veto over the whole Brexit process. And that, well, I think it makes Remainers, a, 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 a leavers, sorry, a mixture of angry or utterly disillusioned. Maybe some of you still think it's all going to be OK. On balance, I still think we are going to leave on March the 29th next year. I do. Although we're going to be so wrapped up in a whole series of agreements that it's going to be years and years until we can get any of the benefits of Brexit. So I'm getting increasingly angry about what is going on. And Chris is right on Twitter when he says, Mrs May is trying to please everyone at the same time. You can't do it. I have some faith, but not much. The way I put it, Chris, is there's a fork in the road and Mrs May's got one of her feet in the right-hand fork and one of her feet in the left-hand fork. And in the end, as the road gets wider... It just becomes completely unsustainable. What does Greg in Southwark in South London make of all this? Good evening, Greg. 
Good evening, Nigel. And um, I absolutely 100% believe you, actually. Um, I don't think you'd be doing this for such a long time without actually conviction. And, well, you know, well played, sir. That's all I've got to say. Well, that was... Um, thank you, Greg. But what now? I've... As I said to your, I think it's your producer or yeah. your, uh, your 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 um, uh, organizer yeah. of the show. Um, I've got a bit of a hole in my heart because what I really think that's going to happen is, and I'm I've, I've thought about this very 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 clearly. I think this is going to be stringed out and stringed out as long as possible because, unfortunately, um, if you haven't got a Com uh, a very strong, convicted leader who's 100% behind anything. Look at Putin. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a bad example, but he is 100% behind <laughs> Russia, although mm -hmm. I don't, would never completely agree with his doctrine. No, no. But what you're saying is Mrs May's not 100% behind Brexit. No, yeah. she's, uh, you've got to have somebody in place yep. that means what they say and says what they mean. Mm. And if you don't have that, it's a it's a basis, it's a foundation for development of your own self, let alone country. And if you haven't got somebody like that at the head... Well, we haven't. Afraid, we're, we're finished. We haven't. So, so when you say, Greg, when you say that you feel you've got a hole in your heart, you're really feeling very down about this, yeah? I'm... I... Origi I voted Brexit, and then... I was talking to my wife. She's from South American country. I convinced her to vote, uh, her to vote Brexit as well. Uh -huh. Then she kind of regretted it. Uh -huh. I kind of regretted it. And now we're actually, we, we, we said, oh, have we made a, the incorrect decision? And then we, 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 we locked heads and we thought to ourselves, no, hold on a minute. We made the right decision because you go back and forth. But then again, you get the doubters. You get yourself doubt. But then again, you come to a point where no, it was the correct. You went. I went with my gut instinct, and on a certain. Why amount, did you doubt it, Greg? I doubted it because I thought we've made the wrong decision. It's too hard to process every single law and uh, undo. 40 odd years of uh, of um, going into it. All right. So, so, so what's then? Know. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, it, it was all presented as being a very difficult administrative thing to do. So, what has swung you back towards Brexit then? Because I've gone back to what I originally believed. Okay. Okay. We have to we have to have a secure country. My main and, and I am no I'm not a racist uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But if you were to mention hold on, we've got to stop immigration, uh, uncontrolled immigration to this country. Mm. Our hospitals, our schools, our health, uh, we just can't sustain well, the uncontrolled Greg, immigration I, to this country. You know, that argument you've made is the argument that was very beautifully put by Caroline Flint, the Labour MP from Doncaster today, or Don Valley, as her seat is called uh, today. Um, uh, yet many, you know, anyone that makes it gets condemned. But Greg, that was the main reason people voted Brexit, and it's not being delivered. Um, if it comes to another battle in the future, will you go into it feeling this is the right thing to do? I tell you what, Nigel, if you take the reins of the horse, mm -hmm. I'll be 100% behind you. All right, thank and you. I will, I will canvas every single person I've known on this universe to support you. Okay. Uh, no, not on the universe, on this country. <laughs> okay, Greg. Greg, thank you for the pressure. Thank you very much for the call. And Greg, interesting call, wasn't it? You know, he votes Brexit, convinces his wife to, uh, but he sees all this negativity that gets put out, begins to doubt it, and now he's back where he was. Okay, so I've got Theo Usherwood, LBC's political editor on the line. Theo, hello. Hello, Nigel. A lot of very, very angry and, and disillusioned LBC voters about the shenanigans, <laughs> shenanigans in Parliament yesterday. I love what Andrew Neil said on Twitter, that almost no one understands how this works, but we all know the can was kicked down the road. Tell us, what's the news today? Let's start with the vote that is taking place at the moment. This is, I think you could call it the unicorn amendment from uh, Jeremy Corbyn. It's the idea that you can have curbs to... Uh, free movement of labour while at the same time retaining the access, full access to uh, the single market. And 
Nigel, I know you're not on Jeremy Corbyn's Christmas card list. I know you're not best friends. I know you wouldn't necessarily go drinking in Islington North. But he but doesn't he drink, has, does he? Don't, no, he doesn't drink. <laughs> I don't know if you'd have a cappuccino <laughs> okay. in Islington okay. North <laughs> with the Labour leader. But with this amendment, he's done you a real... He's done the Brexiteers a real favour because, of course, the other option was to vote for the Lord Hailstrom Amendment, which is the next vote which will come in at around 8 o'clock, which would be to keep Britain in the EEA, the so-called uh, Norway option. And in order to abstain or to get his MPs to abstain on that vote, he had to propose another vote. And it was billed as the softest of soft Brexits, the, uh, the option that, uh, you know, that actually the European Union had, had from the outset dismissed. But this was all about a diversion, making sure that he didn't, with his own MPs, find himself aligning with the likes of Nicky Morgan, uh, Annie Su Anna Soubry, Dominic Grieve, and actually bouncing Britain into okay. uh, the economic area. Now, he's expected to lose this vote. The government won't vote with him, and of course, he won't have the full support of his MPs. The crucial vote is the vote after, and there we will see the splits within the Labour Party. How many Labour MPs vote for the Norway option? And yesterday, of course, it was all about splits within the Tory party. Yep. Today, look at the numbers. How many people within the Labour Party vote for that, op that option? Because that will give us the clearest indication yet of just how split the Labour Party is when it comes to Brexit. It's interesting, isn't it, um, Theo, that, that we don't talk much about Labour splits on Brexit, but actually yeah. out in the country, there's a lot in South Wales, the Midlands, the north of England, a lot of Labour constituencies in which the Labour voters voted Brexit. You're quite right to say that. And, and the reason is, is that Jeremy Corbyn wants to bring down this government at any opportunity. He'll find it. And, and with the economic EEA amendment, he could potentially have done it. But he can't do it. And this is what the Labour strategists believe. He can't do it at the expense of being substituting uh, a, a hard Brexit or uh, the Brexit that Theresa May is proposing uh, in exchange for what might be seen as Brexit in all that name, where we stay within the European economic area and are unable to control our borders because we know mass immigration before the referendum, whether you believe it or not, was a yeah. huge issue amongst working class Labour voters in the West Midlands, in the north of England, in the North East. Real concerns about that. And Jeremy Corbyn and his team are terrified of going into a general election with the, with the tag that they were the ones that rode roughshod over the will of the British yeah. people in the 2016 referendum. So he will he will bring down the government at any opportunity, but not at that cost. It's too great. Yeah, no, I understand that, Theo. So no drama's expected tonight? No. No, splendid. Thank you. And we will look very carefully tomorrow and see, you know, just how many Labour rebels there are, how big the splits are within the Labour Parliamentary Party. The sheer arrogance of these MPs is breathtaking. Don't they realise that they are destroying their own chances of re-election if Brexit is betrayed, says Chris. Uh, democracy is a farce, Mark says on Twitter. I do feel let down completely, but I'm old enough not to be surprised. Like all the other countries that wanted to leave, we too eventually will be forced effectively to remain, says Anne in Kingston. Well, Anne, not if I have anything to do with it. And I also think, I actually genuinely believe that if we do face the worst case scenario, if the Soros-funded campaign, Blair, you know, backed by Blair and Clegg and all the others, if they were to force us, in the worst-case scenario, into a second referendum, frankly, I think the fair-mindedness and, frankly, the sheer bloody-mindedness of people in this country would surprise the establishment. They'd get a result they simply wouldn't be able to ignore. But I don't want it to happen. After all, we weren't told it was the best of three, were we? You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC, and it's now 7.45. It took our Prime Minister nine months, a full gestation, to trigger Article 50. Uh, we then have seen the can being kicked down the road, a transition period being applied for, an extension to that being asked for. Even if we do leave the European treaties on March the 29th next year, it's going to be six or seven years from the vote. Gosh, it's nearly two already, isn't it? Until we've got any prospect of getting back control of our borders or striking out and making our own trade deals around the rest of the world. And the shenanigans that took place in Parliament that potentially could give MPs the right at the end of this whole process to veto the whole thing uh, is 
I think, making the vast majority of Leave voters either very angry or disillusioned. I, I, I've yet really to have a phone call or a text or a tweet from anybody on the Leave side who thinks this is all going swimmingly. To say that, you've got to be a Brexit-supporting Tory MP, it seems to me. I voted to leave, and the main reason I did was so there would be apprenticeship opportunities for my son to get work in the UK in the future, and not to have to compete against an EU undercutting labour force. Well, one of the issues, uh, whether it's trades and skills, whether it's nurses and doctors, uh, you know, one thing for certain, we have been relying far too heavily on foreign labour coming into this country, not training our own people, and in some cases, particularly from outside the European Union, taking doctors and nurses from countries that frankly can ill afford to lose them. Let's go to Natalie, who's calling from Chichester. Good evening, Natalie. Good evening, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. Pleasure to speak to you. So, Natalie, as a Leave voter, how, you know, is Mrs May doing a good job? Not at all, Nigel. And um, I have to say, I find it all rather strange in my eyes. Um, I've got to choose my words very carefully here. All right. Um, but, I, I mean, I have got a question for you as well. All right. And um, they kind of link together. OK. But, you know, we know David Cameron didn't believe in Brexit. So, you know, when the vote come in to leave, he left Parliament. Now, they had a choice. They could have voted somebody in like Boris Johnson. Would he be doing this job better as he believed in Brexit? But instead, they voted in Theresa May, who was a Remainer. Now, she's doing this job, and in my eyes, she's not doing it very well. Now, we all know where the Tories stand on this, and they are going in for another referendum well, if this fails. Well, so, Natalie, some of them yeah, are. Some of them are. I mean, yeah, it's some not... Of, some of them are. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean... Not all of them are. But, I, I mean, I feel like this is kind of going awry. Is it? So we do end up in another referendum in the hope that we stay. Well, uh, you know, Mrs May has said publicly again and again and again, Brexit means Brexit, um, and then going very soft on it. Um, unless Mrs May is the most gigantic liar in history, uh, and I don't believe she is, but I think she's incapable of lying in many ways. Uh, you know, she is, I think, I think, a fundamentally honest person. But, but you can't, Natalie, you can't do anything in life that is difficult without having conviction and belief. And she's there kind of carrying out the will of the people as she see it. But I'm with you. I think, I think she needs to believe in it far, far more. Natalie, would you describe yourself as disillusioned or angry? Um, or both? Both, both. actually. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. both. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think there are lots of us in that category. Natalie, thank you. Got to move on. Andy and Croydon says to me by SMS, I didn't vote for a Brexit Britain. So if it did happen... I would not vote ever again. I don't get the logic of that, Andy, at all. Uh, you know, I think actually the fact you didn't vote for something and it happens, well, you know, surely you should say to yourself, I'll vote for different parties next time and try and reverse things. Um, I, I think it's those that did vote for it and, and, and now fear they're not going to get it uh, that have got bigger problems with this. Uh, Karen is calling from Bracknell. Karen, good evening. Well, good evening, ah, Nigel. Now, Pleasure Bracknell, 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 that's Philip Lee's constituency, isn't it? My name is Karen, I live in Bracknell, and along with 35,000 of my townsfolk, I voted to leave. And that traitor stood up and said that he, he inferred that he had to save us from ourselves. How dare he? How dare he? And the people of this town will not forget that. He will, he will not. He, I, I'll bet you, I'll bet you a pint that he will not be allowed to stand in the next general election. So will the local... Are you, are you involved with the Tory party, Karen, or not? No, definitely not. I would vote UKIP. Just sadly, in the last general election, I wasn't able to vote UKIP. We okay. didn't have a candidate. So do you think the local Conservative Association in Bracknell will kick him out because they believe he is, to quote you, a traitor? Absolutely. I was listening this morning to the, the local Tory party chairman, who he never even informed that he was going to resign from his post. He is absolutely furious. 
and they have they are having a meeting in two weeks time this yep. is what he said yep. they are having a meeting in two weeks time to decide what they're going to do but your mp karen said yesterday that you karen and bracknell didn't really understand what you were doing and you need to be protected from yourself karen He's a fool. Did you hear how he likened us to people that voted... For the death penalty. Uh, for, for, yeah, for the death That's penalty. That's right. That's right. And he said that Parliament had to save the people. Yes. And that's exactly what he's had to do. Karen, he's saving you. You just don't realise it yet. We're furious, Nigel. <laughs> I'm Absolutely sorry. I'm tr- furious. <laughs> I'm trying to tease you on it. I agree with you. I think it's disgraceful. But hey, you know this is uh, this is where we are. Karen from Bracknell, thank you very much indeed. Uh, breaking MPs have voted by 322 to 240 against the Labour amendment to the EU withdrawal bill, calling on the government to negotiate full access to the EU's internal market. Yet more glorious government victories for Theresa May. The trouble is, one or two of them are coming at a terrible terrible price. Tony is calling from Ramsgate. Good evening, Tony. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. So, how do you see things? Uh, I remember you. Right. I remember moving you off my drive in Prestige Avenue and you was coming around there canvassing. You remember? Uh, yeah, uh, Tony, lots of people have moved me off their drives, but go on. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, I believe, right, you've got, you got Russia on one side, uh-huh. you've got America on another side. And uh-huh. then you've got China. And then you've got Europe in the middle. I believe that we should stay in Europe be- as, a, as a one big body. Because, like, you know, we- that's the only way we can compete now. Well, my worry yes, about yeah. all those big block arguments is if we stay in Europe, I worry that people like Mr Verhofstadt might finish up actually t- lurching us into a war against Russia. But, Tony, uh, you know, uh, that's a separate debate. Geopolitics and whether we're better off as an independent country part of NATO or better off part of the European army and foreign policy is a different argument. Do you, Tony, do you, as a Remainer, do you understand why Leave voters in Ramsgate are feeling frustrated with Mrs May? Um... No, not really. And and you as a Remain voter, are you happy that Brexit's being kind of watered down to a soft Brexit? Yes, I do. I think I, I do believe we, we ought to make it a soft Brexit. I really do. So are you happy well, with the way well, things are going? Really, then? really. I'd be honest with you. We should actually have another referendum to stay in. And we, right. need, you, we need you in there, right? Because you need to be in it to change it. Do you, you see what I'm talking about, Tony? I, I, Tony, I understand that. The, I understand that argument, and it, and it was a, always was an argument that appeared to have validity until David Cameron tried right at the last minute to change things. They wouldn't let him do it. We voted Brexit. Tony, I thank you, and I'm sorry if you had to move me off your drive. <laughs> um, my last caller of the evening is Steve from Tunbridge. Steve, hello. Oh, hi there, Nigel. Thanks for taking my call. Um, before I say what I want to say, can I just send a message to Tony to say that, all right, fine, let's say if they get their way, what kind of a remain will we get? A hard remain or a soft remain? Quite. So they, they want us to take us to, to, to an army and a euro and all sorts. So yeah. can we have a second and third and fourth referendum? Yes, just yes. to be sure. Yeah, I mean, Steve, the idea, the idea that staying in gives certainty, which they tried to give us during the referendum and since, is rubbish. The European Union is changing all the time. Juncker's big State of the Union yeah. speech. It's not just full militarisation. It is also a foreign policy where member states would not have veto. And I worry about it becoming an increasingly militaristic and expansionist union, I do. Steve, as a Leave voter, yeah. how are you feeling tonight about the shenanigans yesterday in Parliament? Are you disillusioned? Are you angry? Or do you think the Prime Minister actually will get us there? Well, I'm very disappointed, but I, I, I think we're blaming the wrong people. Mm. I mean, we can't, we can't blame Theresa and the other Remainers for being Remained. I mean, their heart is in Europe, fine. But... Surely the people who voted them into power should have to have a look at themselves and say, how could you vote for a, for a party? I mean, even if Labour was in power now, would still be in the same mess anyway. So how could people vote for these people knowing that... Do, do you know what, Steve? Having sat and watched that committee yesterday interrogating Banks and Wigmore and seeing them all represent Leave constituencies, but all being Remainers, they were, I think, amongst the lowest calibre people I've ever come across in any walk of life. I couldn't vote for any of them. Steve, I thank you. So I'm not sure myself 
whether I'm just disillusioned or whether I'm angry. I'm actually a bit of both. The one thing for certain is Remainers are looking rather chipper in the House of Commons at the moment, certainly compared to the Leavers. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'll be back tomorrow at 7. At 10 tonight, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you.